Good morning. How are you today? On this summer day, it's good to be here with you to be able to worship the Lord together this morning. It's good to be able to um, spend time in prayer, spend time worshiping with music, and of course to expose ourselves to the teachings of the Word of God and to grow in His grace. And so, again, it's a pleasure to be here with you this morning. Let's stand together and let's worship the Lord as we sing Jesus Messiah. Uh, As the musicians are getting ready, let me just note to you that this morning we want to emphasize the life and ministry of uh, some dear friends of ours here at Hope Church, uh, Pam and Bill Knorr, who have served in Japan for, I believe, 37 years, correct? It's a long time. And so now they're Americans again, but they might still have some Japanese ways. You tell me. It's good to have the two of you here with us, and we'll be celebrating later on downstairs. Let's sing together. Humbled himself and carried the cross. Love so amazing. Love so amazing. Jesus Messiah, the name above all names. Bless him. Jesus. 
Jesus Messiah, Lord of all, Lord of all. Then Daniel was brought before the king. The king answered and said to Daniel, You are that Daniel, one of the exiles of Judah, whom the king my father bought from Judah. I have heard of you that the spirit of the gods is in you, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now the wise men, the enchanters, have been brought in before me to read this writing and make known to me its interpretation, but they could not show the interpretation of the matter. But I have heard that you can give interpretations and solve problems. Now if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around your neck and shall be th the third ruler in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another. Nevertheless, I will read the writings to the king and make known to him the interpretation. O king, the most high, God gave Nebuchadnezzar your father kingship and greatness and glory and majesty. And because of the greatness that he gave him, all peoples, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whom he would, he killed, and whom he would, he kept alive. Whom he would, he raised up, and whom he would, he humbled. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened, so that he dealt proudly, he was brought down from his kingly throne, and his glory was taken from him. He was driven from among the children of mankind, and his mind was made like that of a beast, and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. He was fed grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, until he knew that the Most High God rules the kingdoms of mankind, and sets over it whom he will. And you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, though you knew all this, but you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven, and the vessels of his house have been brought in before you, and you and your lords, your wives, and your concubines have drunk wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see or hear or know, but the God whose, in whose hand is your breath and whose are all your ways you have not honored. Then from his presence the hand was sent, and the writing was inscribed. And this is the writing that was inscribed. Mini, Mini, Tekel, and Parson. This is the interpretation of the matter. Mini, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and have found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command, and Daniel was clothed with purple, and a chain of gold was put around his neck, and a proclamation made about him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was killed, and Darius, the Mede, received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. Let's keep our fingers right there in Daniel chapter 5. We're going to be looking at that chapter and unpacking and seeing how it relates to who we are and how we live today. Uh, I think we're all familiar with the phrase, writing on the wall. Uh, the phrase comes from this chapter in the scriptures, the writing on a wall. When people use that expression, the writing on a the wall, they're saying that um, something is inevitable. It's going to happen. The writing is on the wall. Or they're referring to, you should have known because you were warned. You should have seen the writing on the wall. Well, the phrase again comes from this episode in the scriptures, chapter 5. 
As we read through the scriptures, I, I want you to note that the Bible is in the air that we breathe. There's so much of our daily experience, of our daily understanding as Americans, as Westerners, there is so much that is derived from the scriptures, this expression being one of them, the writing on the wall. In Daniel chapter 5, we see here that King Nebuchadnezzar is far gone. He is probably the most popular of the kings listed in that era, in that part of the world, Nebuchadnezzar. He's gone. But so is the memory of what God did during the reign of Nebuchadnezzar to that nation, but in particular to the king himself. It's all gone. Well, I had to do a little research to try to remember who was who and what was the line of monarchs in that part of the world during that time. And I listed it here for you. You see that there was King Nabopolassar, and the King Nabopolassar passed on, and that's when Nebuchadnezzar became the king. He assumed the Babylonian throne. And when the famous Nebuchadnezzar died, he was replaced by his son, Amel Marduk. But Amel Marduk was king for only two years. That's a very short reign. It doesn't compare to the Queen of England today, now does it? Only two small years. And the reason why he lasted only two years is because Neri Glasser, his brother-in-law, assassinated him. Neri Glasser, if I recall correctly, means protect the king. And he killed Amel Marduk. And after just four years on the throne, Neri Glasser dies. I, I don't know why, if it was in battle or if he was ill, but in his place comes his child. He becomes king, a boy by the name of Labashi Marduk, the child king. And he reigned for anywhere from three to nine months. The history is not clear there. But this boy king did not last even a year on the throne when his uncle, Nabonidus, assassinated him. He killed his own nephew in order to take the throne, and he indeed did take the throne. Nabonidus becomes king. However, he decides that he is not going to reign from the capital of Babylon. He's not going to reign from that city. And so he allows his son, Belshazzar, to take care of the city, to sit on the throne. And Belshazzar becomes the regent or the viceroy. And so, as we see here in chapter 5, he is dubbed the king, but really he is the viceroy, the regent. He is the prince king because his father is elsewhere. Uh, Nabonidus reigned for some time, uh, but again, not from his actual throne. And we're not sure as to why he was not there. Where, where did he go? Well, some people speculate that there was better climate elsewhere, and so he moved there and let his son take care of the throne in Babylon. What the history books do tell us is that he was a warrior king and that he spent at least 10 years overseeing the war in the Arabian desert, leaving, of course, his son Belshazzar as the viceroy. Meanwhile, Belshazzar was to protect the capital city, and what a fortress it was. The history books tell us of the beauty of that city. And by the way, that's why in verse 16, Daniel is told that he will be given third place in terms of ruler. He'll be third in terms of secession um, in, ter uh, in regards to who's going to rule the nation. Um, the king, Bondonitis, uh, did I say that right? Nabonidus, rather. Nabonidus is going to be the king first place, his son, Belshazzar, second, and then eventually Daniel becomes a third ruler. Belshazzar, his name means the god Bel will deliver. Well, as you just read, we know otherwise. As the viceroy, Belshazzar very arrogantly indulged himself. He was fully indifferent to the attacking 
army just outside his walls. And as we look at this chapter this morning, I want you to see the influence of Daniel in this nation. Once again, Daniel rises to the top as a man who influences his circle with the truth of God. Belshazzar is having a feast for a thousand people, even though his city is being attacked. It is under siege, but he is very confident. He's the confident vice Roy, confident of victory, and whereas the scriptures don't tell us this, history tells us that eventually the Medo-Persian Empire is able to come through under the walls and raid the city. Historical records tell us that Belshazzar believed that he had enough supplies to last him years under a siege. And so you can see why he's having a feast. He's saying, don't mind them out there. We're fine in here. And so in showing off his ability and his power, looking back at his history and saying, look at what we've done in the past. Look at what we're going to do now. He orders the golden and silver cups from the Jewish temple. There was about 5,000 of them, uh, Ezra tells us, over 5,000, uh, the book of Ezra tells us. These cups were seized from the temple when, when Israel was seized, when Jerusalem was captured. And so now he is very confident, and in a very arrogant tone, he is saying, look, we have beaten the God of the Jews as he drank his wine out of the golden goblet. We have beaten the God of Israel. Do you really think we're worried about the Medo-Persian army outside our walls? <laughs> no, we're not. If we could beat the God of the Jews, we could certainly beat the Medo-Persians. We're going to do just fine. They don't scare me. Bring in the cups. I'll show you what I think of the Medo-Persians. And so this very arrogant and irreverent king drank from the temple cups so as to taunt the God of Daniel. Your God is nothing to us, and neither is this Medo-Persian army anything to us. The Babylonians gave no real attention to the enemies outside their wall. They gave no heed either to what God had already warned them of. He should have known, but he did not listen. Look at what we read at verse 5, chapter 5, verse 5. Suddenly the fingers of a man's hand emerged and began writing opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the back of the hand that did the writing. Would that frighten you? <laughs> it would frighten me. Now keep in mind that these were people who were very much involved in superstition, but they were also very much involved in the magics and, and um, demonic activity. And so whereas this would have been frightening for him, and as you read, it was, it was also more common than what it would be for us because of the world they lived in. Uh, again, they were very much involved in those things that are uh, uh, involved with magic and incantations and so on. But Belshazzar, as a king, he was struck with absolute fear nonetheless. In fact, what we see here described is a physiolog physiological change in him. His face lost all its blood. He became white. And his limbs gave way and his knees knocked. Literally, it reads, the joints of his loins were loosened, which I tend to think is his hips, and I hope for him that's what it was. But what I do find interesting is that he inquires, not whose hand is that, but this is what he asks. What did he write? What did he write? Now, that's not the first question I would ask. My first question would be, who? But he's more interested in what? 
And I think it's more valuable to, to start with who because, because you, you, you want to know the source of what is being said to you. And here we have the who. It is the hand of God. It is the hand of the Spirit of God. The Word of God is valuable. And the Word of God is valuable not simply because of what it says, but because of who said it. And so it would behoove Belshazzar to first find out who said it and then find out what it means. And likewise for us, the Word of God is of great value to us, not simply because of what it says, but because of who said it. The Word of God is God-breathed. That night, Belshazzar's city was captured. As we see at the very end of the chapter, it was captured by a king named, named Darius at the age of 62. And we also see there verse um, 30 that Belshazzar was killed that very same night. Well, let's take a look at who was this King Darius, beginning at verses 30 and 31. Again, he was a 62-year-old national leader of the Medo-Persian Empire. But he was, he was a Mede. He was not a Persian. Uh, well, what's interesting about uh, the history of the Medo-Persian Empire is that the empires were combined, and if you remember the dream of Nebuchadnezzar where there was a statue and as you work your way down from the head, you come to the arms, there's two arms, and the interpretation of the dream was that two empires would come together, and here it is, the Medo and the Persian Empire coming together, joining ranks in order to conquer the Babylonians, the head of the statue. In fact, the Persians conquered the Medes, and then very wisely Instead of simply subjecting them to the rule of the Persians, rather the Persians very wisely bring them together into their culture and together they become a superpower. And together they rule and together they raid and attack and try to conquer and they succeed very much so. On the throne of the Medo-Persian Empire was a fellow by the name of Cyrus, King Cyrus. And like Belshazzar, Darius is the viceroy, the regent of Cyrus. So Darius, the 62-year-old conqueror, is really not the king, but he is ruling in the stead of King Cyrus. Cyrus is somewhere else. And so, like we would have a vice president who would take over the Oval Office, uh, Darius becomes the monarch for the time. Eventually, Cyrus does return. Eventually, Cyrus becomes his, the king again, sitting on his throne, and Darius is given the rule of a governor. So that we read in chapter 6 of Daniel, look at verse 28, 628. So this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. A little hist historical background for you. Uh, consider this invasion. Again, the scriptures do not tell us this, but archaeology and history tell us that King Nabonidus, at this point, while, while Belshazzar was drinking his wine and getting drunk and doing foolish things, the real king was already retreating from the Medo-Persian army. Belshazzar had no idea. He thought he was safe. But the king's army was already in retreat. And it was a Medo-Persian governor by the name of Ugbaro who orchestrated the defeat of the Babylon, of the Babylonian city by diverting the great Euphrates River. He dammed the river. He diverted the river. And this river flowed through the city of Babylon. And by diverting the water, they were able to simply march through the marshes of what became a trickle under the walls of the city by night and invade the city. Again, this is what the historical records tell us. The scriptures that just tell us simply that the city was invaded and the city was captured. The king was killed. And all this happened, by the way, 
on October 12, in the year 539 B.C. October 12. Daniel chapter 5, verse 30 and 31 read, That same night Belshazzar the Chaldean king was slain. So Darius the Mede received the kingdom at about the age of 62. So we see here once again that history proves the Bible, in case you were wondering. Once again, we see that the Bible speaks the truth. Daniel had predicted the fall of Babylon, and here it comes about. The Bible relates to us historical fact, that's for sure. But please understand that secular history bears out the reliability of the Bible again and again and again and again. But let's go back to the middle of this chapter. We've looked at the very beginning. We looked some at the very end. Let's go back to the middle of the chapter where we find once again our hero. Our hero is this man, Daniel, the man of God, who acted like a man of God. That's why he's heroic. He's the man of God who acted like the man of God. So let's take a look at verses 10 through 16. And there you see the arrival of God's man. The writing is now on the wall, and no one is able to translate it. No one knows what it means. And so in comes the queen, and she gives advice. And by the way, I believe this is the, the um, queen mother, uh, probably the wife of uh, Nabonidus. Um, and why do I say that? Because if you look at verse 2, all the king's wives were there already, as well as his concubines. And so in comes this woman, so I, I think it's safe to say that this is the queen mother, and she gives some motherly advice. She comes in and, and she speaks as a mom ought to. She does not have the answer as to what this writing on the wall means. However, she knows where to find the answer. Now, all the leaders of the uh, nation, or in terms of the magicians and enchanters, uh, they were unable to translate it and, and assume the third position in the nation. And so she says, I do know somebody who can. He has in the past. Uh, your, your ancestor, Nebuchadnezzar, did very well. Your father in the past did very well with him by his side. I think, I think he's got something to say to you, son. She does know where to find him. She has not forgotten lessons from the past. And so Daniel is summoned. Now keep in mind that Daniel is a very elderly man at this point. Uh, he's somewhere in his 80s, probably late 80s. So he's up there in years. And Daniel goes before the king, and notice what the king says to him in verses 13 and 16. Twice over he says, I've heard of you. I don't know you, but I've heard of you. You're that guy who came as a slave from Israel. Not exactly a compliment, but he says, I have heard of you. I don't know you, but I do know your reputation. Uh, apparently, Belshazzar had not made much of an effort in the past to get to know this Daniel, but he did hear of him, and now, and now, the man of God is the predominant force in the conversation. Now, this man who had been forgotten is the centerpiece of the palace. When times are bad, people tend to turn to God and God's people. No? When times are bad, people tend to fall on their knees and turn to God. I suppose that's a good thing. But it could also be a wrong thing to wait to the last minute to turn to God. People long to hear the voice of God when emergencies strike. When life begins to scream at us, that daily whisper of God's voice that we've ignored day after day, suddenly we long for it. Where is my God? 
Does he not see? Does he not care about what's about to happen? Suddenly we have this deep longing to have God with us when days are bleak. But unfortunately, it's often too late. The damage has already been done. Certainly that's the case here with Belshazzar. It is much too late. The damage has already been done. God has already determined what will be, and now it will be. He looks to God too late. Many people live like atheists until reality makes them look to God, but not Daniel. Daniel lived with the understanding that God lives today. Daniel lived from day to day with the understanding that his life is a vessel for God and that it is his duty to bring honor to God and to influence his world for God. That's how Daniel lived. And that's why Daniel is summoned. Because of his character. Uh, look at how the queen mother describes Daniel in verses 11 and 12. Here's the legacy of Daniel. She describes him as a man of light. A man with understanding. A man full of wisdom. A man with an excellent spirit. A man who is knowledgeable. A man who possesses an ability to solve problems. What a compliment, isn't it? Christian, this is what God would want others to say about all of us here, young or old, male or female. That we would live a life that would incur this sort of reputation, that this would be our daily legacy, that people would say about you, you are a person of understanding, of knowledge, of wisdom, a person of light with an excellent spirit, a person who knows how to solve problems because of, you know the word of God. This was Daniel. And again, this is why he's summoned. Uh, by the way, a, a side note here, Isaiah chapter 11 describes Christ in many of these ways as well. So we see here that Daniel is a forerunner of Christ. Notice something very important about Daniel. Daniel is able to influence the world around him, not simply because of his accomplishments, but he's able to influence people around him because of his character because of who he was. Sometimes people seek us, not because of who we are, but because of what we know, what we can accomplish. And that's nice. That'll give you a raise, that'll give you a promotion. But not in God's eyes. See, what God is interested in is not in what you can accomplish, but in who you are. And who you are then determines what you could accomplish for him. That was Daniel. That should be us. Looking at verses 17, right on down to verse 24, we see the indictment that comes against the king, King Belshazzar. The indictment. And in it, Daniel is not subtle at all. In fact, you'll notice here that Daniel is very bold. Uh, sometimes it requires boldness. Are you a bold person? I like to think that sometimes I am, but most of the time I am not. I take a great amount of courage in the writings of the Apostle Paul when he asks the church to pray that I will be bold. And when I read through the scriptures, I say, wow, Paul was bold, but you know what he lacked? Boldness. And that's why he asks the church to pray that he will be bold. And obviously, again and again, God answered those prayers. Daniel here is a man who is very bold for the cause of Christ. And I've met people who are bold for the wrong reasons. They're actually, they're actually annoying. <laughs> you know, there, there's a time where you just got to tone it down. You don't have to be bold about everything. But when it comes to the things of Christ, boldness is good. And too often we're timid. We're afraid. Daniel is not. You'll notice here that he rejects the king's rewards. 
at this point, the character of Daniel, I think, really shines. Look at what he says. Uh, you'll notice here that he's not an opportunist. The king just offered him riches and authority, power. He's not an opportunist. Uh, he thinks to himself, I, I already have everything I need. I'm not looking for fortune. I'm not interested in power. I'm not looking for fame. He is willing to labor for God without being compensated. He's able to do God's bidding without any personal reward. He turns to the king. Look at verse 17. He says, let your gifts be for yourself. <laughs> I don't want them. You keep them. In fact, he says, give them to someone else. I don't, I'm not interested. And then Daniel begins to recount the lesson from history, the lesson from Nebuchadnezzar's second dream, the lesson that was learned as Nebuchadnezzar became like a wild beast because of his pride. These are things that Belshazzar knew about. There was only so many years between Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar. He should have remembered. He should have learned from history. As should we. We should learn from history. And as you well know, those who ignore history are doomed to repeat it. This is especially true when we're talking about inspired history, the Word of God. Those who ignore the history recorded here in the Word of God, we are destined to repeat it. And that's not a good thing. How many people have you known over the years who have had the privilege of hearing the gospel over and over again? They have had the privilege of, um, of hearing the message of joy that brings harmony between themselves and their creator. They have heard the gospel and all the promises that it makes. The gospel of grace, meaning it's free. And yet they have chosen to set it aside. They have chosen to ignore it. They said, you know what? I'm just going to do what I want to do instead. Or I'm going to simply believe what I want to believe instead. And they do. They ignore the precepts of Christ. And somehow they think that their end is going to be better than Belshazzar's. or Adams, or Akins, or Demas, or Alexander, who Paul described as one who shipwrecked his, his faith. Somehow they think that their, their destiny is going to be different than Pharaoh's. All these individuals, my friends, that I just mentioned to you, suffered greatly in the hands of a just and holy God who was angry at the sin of that was in his face. And God does answer in anger, holy anger, righteous anger. But he deals with those who reject him over and over and over again. Belshazzar is one example. By the way, the scriptures do speak to this very clearly to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11. This is what we're told. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us. This story here, as well as the story of Adam and Achan and Pharaoh and so on, all this is recorded for us, not only because it's, it's historical fact, but as an example to us, a warning and example to us. We must learn from the biblical record not to repeat the mistakes, the sins of those who have gone before us because the writing is on the wall. Beware. Beware. Daniel does rebuke the king. You'll notice here that though Belshazzar knew it, he did not learn from it. Look at verses 22 and 23. Daniel 5. It reads this way. And you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, though you knew all this, 
But you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven, and the vessels of his house have been brought in before you, and you and your lords, your wives, your concubines have drunk wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see or hear or know, but the God in whose hand is your breath, and whose are all your ways, you have not honored. The writing's on the wall, Belshazzar. You should have seen it. You should have known. And you know something? What Belshazzar did is what people have been doing over the centuries again and again and again. This is how most of the people who share life with us live from day to day. How do you think God is going to respond? should also add to your desire to share the gospel with them, to be like Daniel and influence them for the cause of Christ, for the sake of their souls, for the glory of God and for the good of their eternity. Take the gospel to them because they're living just like Belshazzar. Take a look at the very end here, verses 25 to 31, where we see the sentencing and the execution of justice on King Belshazzar. Here we find the writing on a wall explained. And again, the uh, writing is many, many tekel parson or paris. Uh, here we, we, we see it in Aramaic. Aramaic was a language uh, that was... Um, sort of a Hebrew dialect. It was a language that came about as a result of being in a faraway land in Babylon in captivity. Uh, it's just the way that people began to talk. Uh, it's, uh, I guess we could compare it to Creole. It's not quite French. It's a French dialect that they speak in Haiti. Here we have Aramaic. And the Bible has very small portions written in Aramaic. It's Hebrew, Greek, and very small portions in Aramaic. And here's one of those small portions. Now, we don't know what language was actually on the wall. I doubted that it was Aramaic because then somebody would have been able to read it. And so here it's translated for us, however, in Aramaic. Many, many tekel parson. And so here's the translation that Daniel gives to us, the very translation none of the other magicians or uh, riddle breakers could figure out. Mene meaning, God has numbered your kingdom and it's finished. And it's repeated, many, many, for the purpose of emphasis. It's done. It's over, Belshazzar. Many, many, tekel, meaning you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. In other words, king, you don't have enough. As you all know, in those days, before there were cash registers, what uh, merchants would use is a balance. And if you wanted to buy a pound of salt, you would have to put a, a pound of whatever metal on the other plate and on the balance. And when it balanced out, you had enough. If yours was uh, a short, if uh, your balance was tilted, then it means that you were short and you would have to put more down. And here we find that the king is found wanting. He's short. And parson, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. So it's over, king. You don't have enough, Belshazzar. Your kingdom is divided. There's the writing on the wall. God has set limits on Belshazzar's reign. It was now coming to an end. He was lacking. He owed God. God did not owe him. And therefore, Belshazzar, your kingdom will be divided among the Medo-Persian Empire. And so Daniel is uh, uh, rewarded. And I think we should give that much recognition to King Belshazzar. After all, he did say he was going to do that, right? Um, Daniel just gave him some very bad news. Is, uh, you know, you're, you're going to lose your kingdom. It's over. And yet he still honors his promise. He makes Daniel a third ruler 
in the nation. And all this is happening very quickly. All this is happening in one feast. He gives them purple clothing, which was a symbol of wealth. He gives them a gold chain, which was a symbol of authority. And he raised them to be the third ranking official in the entire nation. But the truth is, he became the third ranking official over nothing. Because the nation was coming to an end. The empire was crashing. And what we see here, verse 30, is that Belshazzar is indeed captured and he's killed. And now the kingdom belongs to the Medo-Persian Empire, which, by the way, is the present-day Iran. Now things just go in circles, right? Babylon is present-day Iraq. Medo-Persians are, are the present-day Iranian people. I'm reminded of what we see in Luke chapter 12 when Jesus Christ tells the parable, the story of the man who is very rich but is also deemed a fool. You'll recall that the words he heard that night after he bragged about everything he had, all that he had accumulated on one day, the next day he hears the words, uh, this night your soul will be required of you. He had so much and he was so proud of himself. Look at what I have accumulated. Look at what I have built. Look at what I have accomplished. And that night after all that bragging and all that success, he hears these words, this night your soul will be required of you. And it wasn't the grim reaper who came to him. It was the very spirit of God that took his soul away. It was all gone. Fool, this night your soul is required of you. Meanwhile, in contrast, we see quite the difference in the legacy of this man, Daniel. His legacy stands. And it stands as one who is influencing his world for the cause of God. This is our calling in this world. This is your calling, Christian, in this world, in this life. What is your purpose? Your purpose in this life, in this world, is to influence people around you for the purpose, the cause of God, Jesus Christ. Yes, in the process, enjoy yourself. Yes, in the process, seek to do well for yourself. Take care of yourself. Take care of those you're responsible for. Educate yourself. Enjoy those vacations. Enjoy those summer reading lists. In the process, make good memories. In the process, rear up your children well. But that's not your goal. That's not your purpose. That's not why God placed you here. That's not why Christ converted you, gave you new life. The reason he has given us new life is so that we will influence the world around us with the purpose and the cause of Christ. That's what Daniel's doing. In the most difficult of circumstances, a man who was captured and taken away as a young boy as a slave. And here now, once again, he's a leader of the nation. This is not the first time this happens to him. Well, in closing, let me give you two things to think about this week. Maybe uh, two pieces of homework for you to consider and to put into practice. Here's the first one. Daniel took full advantage to shine for God in the sphere, in his sphere of influence. He was not looking for position. He was not looking for status. He wanted to be salt in his world. That's what he wanted to do. He did not hesitate to engage as a spokesperson for Christ. He did not say, oh, don't bother me with that again. Oh, we've been through this once before. Forget it. Don't call on me. No, that's not what he did. Daniel drew a circle around himself. And he said, everyone that enters into this circle, I will influence for God. And that's what we need to do. Draw a circle around yourself. Draw a big circle around yourself and say, 
How can I influence anybody who walks into this circle with a purpose, the gospel of Jesus Christ? Here's number two. Besides determining to influence others in your circle with Christ, here's number two. Keep in mind that today, you are the vessel of God. And in, the, in the days of Belshazzar, they had over 5,000 different cups to choose from, all from the temple of God. And it was a defamation. It was uh, near blasphemous to take those cups and drink from it as if it, they meant nothing. As if to say, look, God, we do as we please with the God of Israel, with the God of the Bible. And we see the result in Belshazzar's life. We see God's wrath fall on him very quickly. But keep in mind, my friends, that today you are the vessel of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, in fact, describes us as the temple of God. We are his temple. And so let me remind you, do not misuse the vessel of God yourself. Just as Belshazzar was casual and didn't care and is warned and judged, so we are warned and judged if we live as if God did not matter, as if we did not belong to God. Keep in mind, my friends, not to be casual with what belongs to God. If you know Christ is your Lord and Savior, you belong to God, and that's a good thing. But don't be casual about it. Live as if you belong to Christ. Make your life count for Christ. Become a vessel that is noble in the temple of God. Live that way. And where... Whereas both of these two pieces of homework can be difficult to do on a daily basis, it becomes the wind in your sail. When you bring it before God and say, Lord, use me. Lord, help me to be that Christian, that person who you want me to be. Use me as your vessel. Help me to influence others for your cause, for your sake you'll discover that not only will your life radically change, but the life of people around you will radically change. And you'll also discover that when you go to bed at night, you will sleep well and content. You will say, wow, my God is good. It is good to have him on my side. Daniel did, and God honored him many, many times over. Remember, these things are written for us, as a warning and benefit to us. Let's learn from it. Let me pray. Our Lord and our Savior, we are grateful for the fact that we are your people. We are the sheep in your pastures. And that you have come to us so that we can be servants of you. We pray then, Lord, that we would be just that. Help us to influence others for the cause of our Savior. Help us, Lord, to live lives that are noble before you, lives that do not ignore you. Thank you, Lord, for the richness of the history we see in the scriptures. But most of all, Lord, we thank you for the richness of your grace that corrects us when we do not learn from the past. We pray these things in your name. Amen. darkness tries to roll over my bones when sorrow comes to steal the joy i own when brokenness and pain is all i know i won't be shaken no i won't be shaken cause my fear doesn't stand a chance when i stand in your love my fear 
doesn't stand the chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand the chance when I stand in your love. Shame no longer has a place to hide, and I am not a captive to the lie. Fast behind. No, I won't be shaken. No, I won't be shaken. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. There's power that can break off every chain. There's power that can empty out a grave. There's resurrection power that can save. There's power in your name. Power in your name. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love my fear doesn't stand the chance when i stand in your love my fear doesn't stand the chance when i stand in your love my fear doesn't stand the chance my fear doesn't stand the chance when i stand in your love my fear doesn't stand the chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand the chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand the chance. My fear doesn't stand the chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand the chance when I stand in your love. My doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. When I stand in your love. Oh, I'm standing in your love. When I stand in your love. It was good to worship with you this morning. And I look forward to having lunch with you downstairs as well if you can. And let's pray and close our time of worship. Our Lord, we thank you, for you are a good God. Thank you, Lord, that you oversee all that happens in our lives. We pray, O oh God, that indeed our fear would not get in the way of our service to you. We pray, O oh Lord, that we would be faithful and follow you and influence this world for the cause of Christ alone. In your name we pray. Amen.